spite, betrayal, and egos as big as planets, what happens when a musician makes the biggest mistake of their life? In 1991, after Dr. Feelgood sold around 6 million copies, Elektra Records signed Motley Crue to a $25 million contract. Shortly thereafter, grunge replaced hair metal as the sound of the moment, Motley Crue fell by the wayside, and singer Vince Neil left the band. According to the group's autobiography, Motley Crue, The Dirt, Neil would go out drinking so much that he'd show up late or not at all for rehearsal sessions. After one such instant in February 1992, the band told Neil they were considering replacing him, leading him to storm out of the studio. Bassist Nikki Six wrote, He says he was fired. I say he quit. John Karabi sang on Motley Crue's self-titled 1994 album, a commercial disappointment with a support tour that left the band playing to sparsely populated arenas and small clubs. After his exit, Neil told the Tampa Bay Times he spent four years attempting to reconcile with the bandmates he'd so deeply upset. Finally, he got everyone in a room together. Neil remembered, it was weird, but it was right. And then, with Karabi departing on his own accord, Neil was back in the crew, gratefully performing with the band at the 1997 American Music Awards. Neil later said, I think that night was when I realized how much I love this band, even when I tried so hard to deny it. Actually, I don't think any of us realized how important it was. Nirvana disbanded after the suicide of Kurt Cobain and drummer Dave Grohl using the name Foo Fighters recorded an album almost entirely on his own. When it came time to build a real band around that sound, Grohl recruited Pat Smear, a Nirvana auxiliary member, to be one of the group's guitarists. Years later, speaking about Smear's early years in Nirvana, Grohl said, yeah. I mean, to be honest, when Pat joined the band, he was the best musician in Nirvana. Following the release of the second Foo Fighters album, 1997's The Color and the Shape, Smear quit the band in part because of a spat with Grohl. The frontman had divorced his wife, Jennifer Youngblood, a close friend of Smear, and Smear just couldn't get past that awkwardness. He was also tired of the grind of being in a popular rock band. Grohl replaced Smear with Fran Stahl, a fellow member of the 1980s hardcore outfit Scream, who stayed in the band for two years before he was fired. Chris Shiflett joined up next, and then Smear patched things up with Grohl, because, as it turned out, he simply hated not being in the group. Smear later told the National Post, Every time a new record would come out, I would really miss it, and I'd be like, ah, I wish I played on that. After coming back first as a touring guitarist, and then as a guest on the 2007 album Echoes, Silence, Patience and Grace, Smear rejoined the group on a full-time basis. Judas Priest started out as a hard-edged progressive rock band in the late 60s, but after the addition of operatic lead singer Rob Halford, they became one of the progenitors of British heavy metal. Speaking of screamers, as singers, do you call yourself a singer or are you more like a screamer? Are you, are you offended if someone calls you no, a screamer? No, I mean, it's, it's rock and roll. Halford played his part and then some, with his soaring vocals about darkness, crime, aggression, and lust immortalized on songs such as Breaking the Law, You've Got Another Thing Coming, and Turbo Lover. Then in 1992, Halford left Judas Priest. He later told Rolling Stone, my exit was due to probably the similar circumstances as a lot of my friends, lead singers that I know that went on the same self-journey of discovery. I think it was important for me to do that. Judas Priest moved on too, hiring Tim Ripper Owens as Halford's replacement, having plucked him from a Judas Priest cover band. Then in 2003, Judas Priest announced that Halford was back on lead vocals. That reunion came about because Halford deeply regretted leaving the band, and he missed his friends. So he put his feelings out there, writing an emotionally raw letter to his old bandmates. He tells Metal Hammer, I went into the coffee shop and bought a cup of coffee, sat outside with some blue paper and a blue envelope, and poured my heart out into what was six, seven, or eight pages of where I was at and what I was feeling. Halford was quickly taken back into the fold. In the 1970s, each member of KISS took on their own fantastical persona, along with Gene Simmons, The Demon, Paul Stanley, The Star Child, and Ace Frehley, The Spaceman. Drummer Peter Chris was the cat. Chris also sang lead on KISS's biggest hit. The ballad Beth reached number seven in 1976. Nevertheless, Simmons and Stanley found Chris's drumming subpar and made him audition in 1980 to keep his spot in the band. It didn't go well, and Chris departed. After all that drama and embarrassment, what brought Chris back into the band in 1995 was a combination of pity and money. 
His solo career hadn't panned out, and according to Chris's memoir, Make Up to Break Up, Stanley and Simmons had been swindled by a manager. Thus, the duo agreed to perform at a KISS convention and tape an episode of MTV Unplugged, reaching out to former bandmates Freely and Chris to join them for those onstage reunions. Chris adamantly refused the offer, but when KISS's manager explained that the project could be lucrative, he signed on. During the convention's mini-concert, Stanley and Simmons brought out Freely and Chris to the surprise and delight of the audience. Chris later wrote, The energy in the room was just insane. During his performance of Beth, Chris glanced at Simmons. He wrote, He had that ka gleam in his eyes again. He could just smell that money. The music of the Grateful Dead required the services of two drummers. One of them was Mickey Hart, who joined the band in 1967. We're different people and he, he doesn't play like me i don't play like him yeah. but we love each other's technique and it goes together really well in 1970 band associates confronted financial manager lenny hart mickey hart's father about tens of thousands in missing funds after paying back ten thousand dollars hart disappeared with all of the grateful dead's cash on hand temporarily preventing them from going on tour and earning a living lenny hart was arrested in san diego a year later and a court convicted him of embezzlement he spent six months in jail, and the dead got back $55,000 after filing suit. In that cloud of criminality and embarrassment caused by his father, Mickey Hart left the Grateful Dead. In his memoir Deal, the band's other drummer, Bill Kreutzmann wrote, Mickey took all of this the hardest. The rest of us had just been ripped off by our manager, but Mickey had just been ripped off by his own dad. It would take Lenny Hart's death in 1975 to pave the way for Mickey Hart to rejoin the dead. And while his bandmates were sympathetic, Hart still had to persuade them for reinstatement. Kreutzmann was the toughest to convince, but he was too high on opiates to put forward a cohesive argument. He later wrote, Instead of objecting like I wanted to, I just gave a very stoned, okay, whatever you say. In the early 1970s, Journey was an experimental, instrumental jazz rock outfit. By 1977, however, Journey had taken a more commercial direction, hiring singer Steve Perry and finding massive chart success. In just 10 years, Journey released eight multi-platinum albums and scaled the charts with one anthemic rocker after another, like Don't Stop Believin', Open Arms, and Separate Ways. Around 1987, Perry abruptly announced to the rest of Journey that he was done, effectively ending the band. He later told GQ, and I'm sure they thought, oh, there he goes, solo career, F Steve. But he didn't release a new solo album until 1994. Instead, he rested his voice and grieved his mother, who had died while Perry was making the Raised on Radio LP. It seems like it was a, a brilliant thought process, but the truth is I had no choice. I was truly burned out. Journey would reunite in the 1990s, and it was all Perry's idea. Feeling nostalgic and finally ready to rock again, Perry contacted each of his old bandmates and got them on board. Reconstituted Journey ultimately recorded Trial by Fire and prepared to hit the road for a tour. Then, Perry went on a hike in Hawaii and found himself unable to walk due to excruciating pain. Facing hip surgery, Perry gave the rest of the band his blessing to tour with another singer, and so Journey reunited without the man who had gotten the band back together. Since 1975, Iron Maiden has brought heavy metal to the head-banging masses. Bruce Dickinson wasn't an original member of the band. He joined in 1981 as their fourth lead singer. It was his voice that fueled Iron Maiden's biggest successes, though wailing his way through ominous, darkly fantastical songs like The Number of the Beast, Run to the Hills, and Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter. In 1993, Dickinson left the band, anxious to try other musical outlets. At a speaking engagement in March 2022, he remembered, I just thought that if I stayed with Maiden forever, all I would learn about was what it was like to be in Maiden. What I want to do in terms of music is probably going to be a bit too broad to be covered by Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden brought in Wolf Spain singer Blaze Bailey to replace him, and the two LPs on which he sang were the lowest selling of the band's catalog to that point. Dickinson didn't fare much better with his solo gambit, landing just a few minor hits in the UK. At the end of the 90s, Iron Maiden fired Bailey. Band manager Rod Smallwood persuaded Iron Maiden guitarist and leader Steve Harris to ask Dickinson to return. Harris explained, the thing is, we know Bruce and we know what he's capable of. And you think, well, better the devil you know. Dickinson was also apprehensive about returning to the group he'd so emphatically rejected. But upon their first meeting, characterized with mutual reluctance, 
Harris and Dickinson slowly warmed to the concept of reuniting. Pop-punk trio Blink-182 sold millions of albums in the early 2000s with hits such as All the Small Things and What's My Age Again. The band took a hiatus in 2005, but it looked more like a split. In the aftermath, guitarist Tom DeLonge formed Angels and Airwaves, while bassist Mark Hoppus and drummer Travis Barker soldiered on as Plus 44. In 2009, Blink-182 announced a reunion, releasing a statement that suggested that personal acrimony had led to the long split. It read, Preparing to tour the world again, friendships reformed. Barker had survived a brutal private plane crash the previous year, an impetus for the reformation. He told Rolling Stone, We only got back together, I don't know, maybe because I almost died. Six years later, the band fractured again, with Hoppus and Barker placing the blame squarely on DeLong. In a January 2015 statement, Blink-182 said that DeLong had quit, which the guitarist denied. Whatever the reason for his departure, creative and personal tensions in Blink-182 at the time were high. Years later, DeLong once again put all of his negative feelings about his bandmates to rest. After a near-fatal event, Hoppus was diagnosed with cancer. Blink-182 announced a reunion with DeLong in 2022, and in an Instagram post thanking his replacement, Matt Skiba, he explained his return. Mark's cancer really put things in perspective. John Frusciante was the Red Hot Chili Peppers' fourth lead guitarist, joining the punk funk outfit in 1988. Those are his licks on smash hits like Give It Away and Under the Bridge. But success unnerved Frusciante. In his autobiography, singer Anthony Kiedis quotes Frusciante as saying, we're too popular. I don't need to be at this level of success. By the end of 1991, the guitarist and singer were no longer on speaking terms, and Kiedis believes Frusciante purposefully performed poorly when the band appeared on Saturday Night Live in 1992. A few months later, Frusciante quit the Red Hot Chili Peppers in the middle of the band's tour of Japan. Without him, the band struggled to find a new musical direction. In 1998, Frusciante enrolled in a drug rehab program. He had successfully overcome a heroin addiction, but still needed treatment for alcohol and crack cocaine abuse. After his discharge, bassist Flea asked Frusciante to be a chili pepper again. Kiedis recalled, John started sobbing and said, nothing would make me happier in the world. The guitarist played on three Chili Peppers albums, left once more in 2009, and then returned yet again in 2019. If you or anyone you know needs help with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357.